hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to vlog 146, Frame and Reframe. And this vlog this week comes via request from Angie. Hello Angie, you are wonderful. And she was responding to a series of comments made by the wonderful Todd Deering and myself during our New Year's Day vlog where we talked about framing, reframing, the PhD and the post PhD future. So it's an incredible joy and privilege to deliver this vlog to you for many reasons. Firstly, and I apologize my voice in advance, bit of a head cold going on. So really the vlog this week is brought to you by Ren and Stimpy. So I'm going to try and eh, scream my way through it, but let's see how we go. But why this is such a, a fascinating topic, frame and reframe is it makes you think about methods, methodologies, theories, research questions, but it also ensures that you're thinking about the reframing of your research after the conclusion of your candidature. And why I was particularly enthusiastic to offer this vlog to Angie so quickly. So there was Todd's vlog and she immediately emailed and said, could you do something on a frame? And I immediately wrote that is because unbelievably I wrote an essay in one of my undergraduate bachelor degrees on frame using continental philosophy. So it was quite provocative and brilliant, can I say, some 30 years after I wrote that undergraduate essay to return to the frame and reframing. And the literature is provocative and really interesting. And the literature that we're deploying this week, yes, involves continental philosophy. It also involves North American mass communication theory, we're using some psychology, we're using some coaching theory, and also industrial sociology. So it's a lovely, really radically interdisciplinary, anti-disciplinary, post-disciplinary conversation. So what the frame does at its most basic is it sets an agenda. It provides a way to create meaning. Frames are organisational strategies. They organise people, they organise places, they organise organisations, and yes, they also organise ideas and knowledge. It is a social construction. And at its most basic, what that means is it configures information in a particular way for a particular audience. The remarkable Irving Goffman, who has really been a very, very unfashionable theorist for many decades, is suddenly back in popularity. And he focused very strongly on the frame and framing. And he argued that every single one of us interprets the world through what he called a primary framework, a primary framework. So that, that primary framework is taken for granted by the user. So that means we move through life thinking we're seeing the truth, thinking we're seeing reality. And actually our primary framework is that which guides how we understand the world. We don't see the frame or the framework. We simply move through life going, oh, isn't this going incredibly well? So of course this primary framework also creates bias discrimination and prejudice because any ideas or any people that don't fit into our primary framework we tend to discard or dismiss or demean isn't this going well now there are several particularly there are seven frameworks in which we think about the frame seven frameworks for the frame if you will and these come from Fairhurst and Saar Fairhurst and Saar. So seven ways, strategies, modes of configuring a frame in our daily life, let alone in research. And the first is through metaphor. So we construct our idea by framing it in contrast to something else. So we use a metaphor. So when we really, really love somebody, we say, you are my world. That's a metaphor. You are my world. Now, of course, they're not your world, they're a person, eh? But that's how we use the frame to say, this person is so significant, they are your world. The second strategy is through narrative. And this is just the building block of our culture and our civilization. So if you think about it, myths and legends are frames. 
We think about a love story, think about a happy ending. Those sort of narrative arcs are frames. So if we're a bit miserable at the moment, we go, oh, well, look, if I just fall in love, I'm sure there'll be a happy ending. Good luck with that. So that's, again, another frame. The third frame is tradition. Traditions and also rituals. So rituals and ceremonies render relatively mundane events significant. So if you think about it, Christmas Day is just a day of the year. The day on which we are born is just a day of the year. But through particular rituals and celebrations involving cake and food and some religious configurations, cards and so forth, presents, through these types of rituals, we render a particular day framed as significant. So tradition. Another way we can figure a frame is through slogans or via jargon. So we make an object meaningful by slotting it into a catchy phrase. The best example I can think of this is like sunscreen, okay? Like sunscreen is just a thing in the world. But when we put it into a slogan, so slip, slop, and slap, we render something pretty banal, like sun, sunscreen, suddenly very significant. We have framed it as part of something important. So slogans often do that. And by the way, that's how advertising works. Take something that we don't really need and puts it into a slogan and all of a sudden it's part of our lives. Right. And then, of course, we're dealing with artifacts. So objects that are given intrinsic value via their framing. So through framing, particular objects become more meaningful than just the object itself. And this is very, very common, can I say, in many religions and faith structures. So if you think about it, the cup that's holding the wine during many masses. So there's often a bell, there's often a series of prayers that are offered, and that wine in a cup becomes the blood of Jesus Christ. So that's a great example of how a ritual and how an object is rendered significant through changing its frame. Wine is just wine, and then wine becomes the blood of Christ. Yeah. Also think about frames with regard to flags. Flags are just pieces of fabric. But when we frame that object, that flag, in a particular way, then it becomes incredibly significant, signifying the nation. Okay. Another way we frame is through contrast. And this is actually the frame I use the most. So an object, an entity, an idea, a theory is defined by that which it is not. So that which is blue is not red, beige, or yellow. A man is that which is not a woman. And finally, the way in which we configure a frame is through spin. Spin can be positive and negative, and we still use the adjective in response to spin, so a positive spin, a negative spin. So what this means is there is an inherent bias in the frame in which we are configuring. So a great contemporary example I can give you of this is Mexicans. Mexicans is simply a, a group, a population from a particular nation, Mexico. But when a spin is placed on that via, say, Donald Trump, so when he uses the word Mexicans, it becomes part of a threat, a xenophobic threat, and it's required that we supposedly build a wall between the United States and Mexico because Mexicans are a problem. Now, that's not real, that's not natural, that's not accurate. That is a negative spin, a frame around Mexicans. There is nothing intrinsic to Mexicans that connote threat, but the frame renders it so. So as you can see, framing is used through diverse agendas, intellectual agendas, political agendas, and social agendas. And what it does is it creates a strategy. It creates that narrative, narrative so that some variables are incredibly important and focus our mind a great deal, and we forget about a lot of other things that are outside of the frame. 
you can see how it operates. Now, framing is incredibly important to you, our extraordinary postgraduates. It really is a significant word and trope because it offers an explanation for an event, an experiment, or an idea. And if your frame is correctly configured, then your argument will be believable by your examiners. So this really matters. But in daily life, so all of us as citizens, frames render our lives a lot easier. So what happens is we have a frame, that primary framework that Goffman discussed, and we basically try and insert all the information we receive during the day into our primary framework so that we're not troubled terribly much. So everything that we take on board during our days that we understand is real and true and important, none of that troubles us. It fits into our primary framework. We go, oh yes, I'm right. Obviously I'm right. I'm right. Here's another bit of information. You know what? I'm right. And so that's why all our friends on Facebook give us information. We go, oh yes, she's clever because she's a friend of mine and she thinks like I do. Uh, we watch newses, for example, that tend to reinforce our primary framework. So none of us as citizens like information that troubles us or challenges our socialization. But the problem we've got is PhD students in many ways must be far greater and much more than is what required of us as citizens. So that sort of primary framework, that bias, is not enough for research and indeed can hurt research. You often hear me say it's important that we disseminate and understand the differences, if you will, between experience and expertise. This is why because experience is a primary framework. It's a frame and it's very difficult to critique. Expertise, so reading widely, research, critiques the assumptions that we take for granted. So that's why it's so important. And remember a PhD is not a space for mental shortcuts. So in terms of methods, in terms of framing your research questions, wow, the frame is everything. Unless you are aware of your frame, you're going to be assuming that you're telling the truth. You're going to, be, going to be assuming that you're simply relating reality. And all you're actually doing is describing the stuff that exists within your frame. So therefore, what we need to do as a PhD student, as a researcher, is understand that frame, disclose that frame, discuss the frame, and also be very well aware and talk about the alternative frames that are available, the alternative lenses that are available to interpret and understand that information. So as most of you know, when I talk with my PhD students, I ask them to overtly talk about what their primary frame is. What is their frame? What brought them to this research? What in their experience in their life brought them to this project? And to disclose that. But also state very clearly what they're not talking about. So talk about those other frames. So demonstrate to the examiners you know these other frames exist. And then explain why for this particular project, they were not useful. So always talk about what you are talking about in the introduction, but always talk about what you're not talking about as well. Be overt, be clear, and then the examiner will understand, oh right, so you're working from this frame, that's cool, theory, method, you're working from here, but the student understands these alternatives exist and the strengths and weaknesses of those alternatives. So as you can see, justification is the key here. Make the argument, don't assume the argument. And remember, Goffman, that primary framework, be aware of it. And be aware that that primary framework is your subjectivity, your bias. And how are you managing that in and through your research? So if it helps, see the frame as a window frame. You know it's a piece of glass. Start to see the glass. See the frame around it. And you know what, every now and again on that beautiful glass, you'll see yourself coming back to you. So think about it very much as a window frame rather than a wall, rather than a limitation. And describe the view while also, as a PhD student, being able to turn 
your head and see the other views, see the other windows, see the other frames. And of course, right now, that's where reframing becomes incredibly important. So I think reframing is the most important concept for you in your post-PhD, post-candidature research career, because it's about dissemination. You can't disseminate unless you reframe. Because you had one frame for your PhD. You had examiners, you had regulations, you had policies and procedures, that's a frame. And you are released from that frame once the PhD has been passed by those examiners. So after the thesis, the frame must change. New audiences. So think about how particular components of the thesis, it might be methods, it might be a particular theory, it might be a part of a chapter, can be taken and reframed and new audiences found for it through a dissemination strategy. So you'd be amazed how often a tiny part of one chapter can often become the basis of an entirely new project. That is a reframing. Now, particularly translational research is a great example of reframing. So you wrote the thesis for this particular audience, but you know what? There might be another audience at allied health professions, in education, in medicine, in nano, hide all our nano guys and gals. You'll be amazed. So you've got to think about alternative frames, open yourself out and a small portion of your, your research can translate into a new frame and create new audiences. So that's why reframing matters. It creates, yes, those new audiences for your research. It can also create better decisions for you. So you had to make these decisions about your research to fit in with a PhD. Now you can make different decisions about the trajectory of that research and you can increase the options that are available for who may read it. So as you can see, why I love reframing is it's a proactive rather than a reactive strategy. So it's about you saying, my research matters and I'm gonna prove it to you. I'm just not gonna let research and life happen to me. I'm gonna claim my research and I'm gonna to prove to you its value by reframing it, crucial. So that's where you can start to use your research to create change. So as you can see, the frame matters to every single PhD and every single PhD student, no matter what your discipline. And reframing matters to every post PhD student and every bit of research that you develop. It's powerful. This is energetic. This is excellent. So today, when you're thinking about the frame and the reframing, this will enhance your reflexivity. It will enhance your passion, and your capacity to transform, if I can use the old cliche from Gramsci, common sense to good sense. And that is the most powerful frame of all. Thank you for hanging with me through this voice. We somehow did this, who knew how? But I wish you all love, light and peace. Tea out. <laughs>